I'm William Flavin. I'm the Director of Doctrine, Concepts, Education, and Training at the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute located at the U.S. Army War College. Well, I've been at PKSOI almost from the beginning of PKSOI. I've been here a little over 10 years, and PKSOI is about 13, 14 years old, so it's close to the beginning of the, of the Institute. The world is still an unsettled place in certain areas. Uh, as evidenced by the 17 UN missions that are out there today uh, with over 100,000 plus UN peacekeepers. When the Peacekeeping Institute was established in 1993, there were only 50,000 peacekeepers out there in the world. Now the UN is the second largest troop deployer on the planet because there are instability and areas of the world that need to be tended to. Uh, and therefore the Peacekeeping Institute is well situated to deal with those actions. With the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the Gulf War uh, in 1991, General Gordon Sullivan was the Chief of Staff of the Army at the time. And he looked around and tried as the Chief of Staff of the Army to look to the future. He realized right at the end of the Gulf War he had to deal with the Kurds in Operation Provide Comfort, where the Kurds had been driven into the mountains and had to be returned to their homes, and it was not a typical action that people were conducting inside of Iraq in the first Gulf War. He also was faced with such things as Rwanda, uh, faced with uncomfortable activities out there. And he looked at the world and said, I bet this is the future. I bet the future is not the Gulf War. I bet you the future is going to be more Rwandas, more provide comforts. And then he looked around the Army and said, okay, what do I have in the U.S. Army that's positioned to talk about this at the strategic and operational level? And he found nothing. So he went to the Army War College and told the Army War College fellows, think about this and make a recommendation. And they came back and made a recommendation. They recommended that some sort of institute ought to be put together. It ought to be located at the Army War College, operating at the operational and strategic level. General Sullivan enjoyed, so to say, this insight that he got from the Army War College, and that was another one of the key impetus that he had for putting the Peacekeeping Institute, as it was called at the time, together. And he put it together and told it to get engaged. We've moved from a world that would look like the Cold War uh, with the fall of the wall to an engagement of all of the nations into this area that we might call stability operations area. Some used to call it low intensity conflict. Some use the term irregular warfare, counterinsurgency. But uh, it's the area that the U.S. military has been engaged in for over 85 percent of its time. Uh, so it's nothing new. Uh, but we are now into the era catapulted there by the fall of the wall and then with several incidents that occurred, which now drives us to an area where all of the countries of the world are interested in trying to deal with the environment out there, create safe and secure areas uh, in order to promote their national interests and the interests of the United Nations and the collective interests. The Peacekeeping and Stability Ops Institute was created with that type of world in mind. It was created with capabilities to deal and think about that type of world. Probably everyone from Lieutenant Colonel on down in the U.S. military has experienced this new world. From Haiti to the Balkans to Kosovo to Afghanistan to Iraq, their life has been now molded by the experience uh, of this type of warfare. And as it continues, uh, it soon may be second only to our conflict with the Indians on the plains of the United States, uh, you know, which lasted about 40 years, uh, we may very well be 20 years into this conflict and a whole generation uh, of military will have experienced it. I can see in the classroom that this has been a sea change in thinking. Most of the problems out there are not well handled by military force. Most of the problems are political, uh, social, economic, and therefore those other actors have to be primary in addressing these various problems and issues. 
and PKSOI's position to listen to those voices, uh, to encourage those voices, and try to link those voices to the military, a sort of as a halfway house, you might say, uh, between one world and the other. And been able to maintain that over the years based upon the fact that they have gone out and walked the ground with the non-governmental organizations. Uh, they've been there and listened to their cases. They've actually helped them as needs be on various issues that they have. Uh, one of the complaints many of the organizations have when they get in the room with the military is that they usually listen uh, rather than talk. Uh, but PKSOI has learned to listen rather than talk. And this has helped a great deal in working the seams. Based upon what General Sullivan saw, he needed an organization that could work in the, in the seams, uh, could work in places that normally couldn't work in, uh, and, and bring divergent views uh, to military and civil leaders, sort of being the in-between person. Uh, he allowed the Institute to develop a charter that was broad and allowed them to go out and seek gaps and, and seek problems. Nation building, nation assistance had always been there, but here nation building and nation assistance were in conflict areas uh, under fire, under people who wouldn't want this to succeed. Um, and all of this comes about so that by the year 2004, we have a major movement. The major movement is the issuing of the Department of Defense Directive 3005. Department of Defense Directive 3005, first time that has been put out, that says, lo and behold, stability operations is co-equal to combat operations. And therefore, everyone was going to have to be able to do both. This was a sea change, uh, and it would drive all sorts of doctrinal input. We, we write doctrine, and our motto always has been is, if we write it, will they read it? Well, in uh, about 2000, 2001, we had an after-action review of Kosovo, and we brought the commanders in for Kosovo and held up the current doctrine that existed because there was peace operations, peacekeeping doctrine that had been written in uh, 2004. And when we held it up and says, did you read this? Uh, no. Did you read this one? No. Did you read that one? No. So we said, well, how'd you figure out what to do? He said, well, the 90-day train-up before we went is what we figured up to do. If it was pitched up in that 90-day train-up, we got it. If it wasn't, didn't do it. So that drove home to us that the education and training was extremely important, uh, as important, if not more so at times, than the doctrine itself. Uh, because what was pitched up and what was developed and what was put out in the training base and the education base to them was all important. So it's not enough just to write it. You have to make sure it gets out to them in the format that they can understand and take on board and then continuing education after they're already moved and in the operation. That's where we're at today, uh, trying to bring this doctrine down to the tactical level uh, so everybody understands what's happening. And we need to gather the information back out from the field uh, in an iterative way. There's continuity uh, that was established by General Sullivan back then because he saw the need. He was concerned and wanted this to be institutionalized in the U.S. military. How could it be institutionalized? Um, it was difficult, but as you see, the peacekeeping institute still exists.